This is our league, and this is your league. From the 55-yard line on CFL America Radio and the Sports History Network. Canadian football is a magic show, a century-old spectacle, grown men battling to cross a line drawn in the dirt. It is a game filled with heroes, great players and great teams, bringing championship pride to their faithful fans. The field is a battleground where skill and determination are the tools of the trade. It is a game that has grabbed the nation by the heart. An annual struggle becomes an epic battle as teams fight for the ultimate glory. The chance to hold the Grey Cup and become forever known as a champion. At the dawn of the 20th century, Edmonton had little in the way of big city life, but it did have Canadian football. The Edmonton Eskimos were born in 1910, but through the decades the team lived an uncertain existence as leagues came and went. Spurred by the excitement of the Calgary Stampeders' victory in the 1948 Grey Cup, 20,000 Edmonton fans bought $1 shares, revived the team, and brought in a man who could kick field goals and coach, Annis Stukas. Stuk came in here and boy, he talked up a storm. He was wonderful because he spoke everywhere. He was around the city and he did more off the field maybe than what he did on the field and in coaching the club. I'm not saying the club was bad, but I mean, you know, they were starting in 49, but if you wanted to make an impact, Annis Stukas made an impact. Stuke spent three seasons in Edmonton as the Eskimos assembled a powerful roster, including Billy Vessels, outstanding receiver Roly Miles, the China Clipper Normie Kwong, and perhaps the greatest of them all, an all-round athlete from Mississippi State, Jackie Parker. I really wasn't expecting to ever make a living playing football. I thought I might be able to be good enough to, to make a living playing baseball. And Darrell Royal, who was my backfield coach in, in Mississippi State went to Edmonton as head coach so he came back and he said you know he says you could uh, you'd really like Edmonton you'd really like the way they play football he says uh, I think you got a good, really good chance up there. In 1954 with Bernie Filoni at quarterback and outstanding rookie Parker at halfback the Eskimos captured the West earning a trip to the Grey Cup. Facing the Eastern powerhouse Montreal Alouettes few gave the Eskimos a chance. They were huge underdogs. They were going up against the mighty Montreal Alouettes. There was no interlocking play in those days. And so they'd never seen one another. And no one, no one gave the Eskimos a chance. It, it was really strange to me because uh, we went into that 1954 game, read all the press clippings about the Montreal Alouette team, and saw um, Red O'Quinn, saw um, Echeverry, saw Hal Patterson. They were just a massively talented team and we wondered I, see, I wondered anyway how we'd ever beat them. The Montreal offense lived up to its reputation, but the Eskimos battled back. With less than three minutes remaining and the Elves threatening to put the game away, Montreal halfback Chuck Hunsinger fumbled, and Jackie Parker raced 90 yards into history. 
when I picked the ball up, it really was just a matter of running. And Sam Etcheverry, the Montreal quarterback, was about 10 yards away, but uh, I, I, I had a little more speed than Sam, and I had a, an edge on him anyway. So it was just a matter of running it down the field, and it turned into being quite a play. Parker's touchdown and Bob Dean's point after gave the Eskimos the win in their first Grey Cup championship. For Parker, the victory brought both elation and relief. When we finished the Grey Cup that day, I was tired and I was pretty beat up. So it was just a matter of, you know, it was jubilation, it was joy, it was happiness to win. But you know, it really didn't hit you till a few days later. Then you really, you know, it really kind of hits you then. And say, hey, this is kind of a big deal. Edmonton's surprising victory marked the beginning of a dynasty. For three consecutive seasons, Eskimo fans would celebrate as their heroes defeated the Eastern champion Alouettes in the Grey Cup final. While the Eskimos boasted a star-filled roster, it was Jackie Parker who shone brighter than all. Jackie Parker is the best ever did it. The guy played halfback, defense and offense halfback. The guy played quarterback. He punted the ball. He kicked off. He kicked field goals. He did everything but sell tickets. He could do anything you asked him on the field. He, he could run back kickoffs if you wanted him to. He could uh, play defense, and all this on a pair of legs that you wouldn't believe could carry him across the street. But he um, was really an amazing athlete. I had nightmares about that guy because, uh, you know, there's some people that you can that have the, the will, you know, the will to win, the will to do things. And he willed himself to do a lot of things because you look at him, he's not a, you know, just spindly-legged, you know, kind of a guy, but a great competitor. When you put Parker... Jackie Parker, Johnny Bright, Normie Kwong. I mean, that was a tough act to beat. In 1959, Tommy Joe Coffey made the long trip from West Texas State University to Edmonton's Clark Stadium, where his real football education began. All of a sudden, you're playing and practicing against guys that uh, are playing for money. They're paying to feed their families. They're playing to pay the rent. They're paying to pay the mortgage on the house or the car or whatever the case may be. And it's dead serious. We had seven people competing for the position I was playing. So Jackie threw me a ball and I dropped it come back to the huddle and I said uh, sorry and he looked at me and he said no he said don't be sorry we're gonna run the same play I'm gonna throw the ball in the same spot and if you drop it just keep right on going get in your car and leave because you won't make this football team I don't think I ever dropped another ball that Jack threw to me. through much of the 60s the Eskimos struggled when rookie kicker Dave Cutler joined the team in 1969 Edmonton fans saw little to jeer about. My rookie season was brutal. Um, I'd like to say I was bad, but um, I was worse than that. I mean, it's not many guys can say single-handedly they can get a coach fired. And I, I think the numbers were that uh, we lost five games by a total of nine points. And that year, I believe I missed seven converts. So my second year, I decided that I was either going to do it right or not do it at all. Dave Cutler did more than get it right, as he went on to dominate the CFL kicking game for the next 15 seasons. In the 70s, the Eskimos began to rise again, led by quarterback Bruce Lemmerman, receiver George McGowan, and a late cut from the BC Lions, quarterback Tom Wilkinson. I came over with the thought, if I don't make the team, because there's no guarantees, then I'll stop by Calgary uh, after I get released. And then if I don't make it there, that's on my way down to Wyoming to go back and get a, a job. Tom Wilkinson's stop in Edmonton would last through 10 highlight-filled seasons. Although many had questioned Wilkinson's athletic abilities, in Edmonton, he quickly proved that he knew how to win. 
My biggest asset was I was a very good student of the game. And I knew what my strengths were and what my weaknesses were. And that's why you never saw me try to throw many 60-yard passes because it would have taken me three to get it 60 yards. When he came to Edmonton, he just absolutely turned around a team that was going in 35 different directions and absolutely taught people how to win in just a very self-effacing and humble way. He was just an absolutely amazing man. Ray Yock was the coach one year, and uh, Wilkie uh, went down in the game and uh, had to be replaced for the last few minutes, and we asked him, uh, what's wrong with Wilkie? He said he sprained his fat. <laughs> to me, that just sort of defined Wilkie, but he just somehow got it done. When they didn't have the ball, the Eskimos turned loose the Wolves, a defense led by Dr. Death, Dave Fennell, and 1975 arrival, linebacker Dan Kepley. Danny Ray, when he came in, he just knew that this guy was somebody different. I mean, he sat right across from me. And, I mean, I just watched this guy look around the dressing room, and, I mean, he was just like a caged dog. I mean, you know that this dog could get out and get after it. When you're six foot, maybe 205, maybe 210 pounds on your best day, uh, I had to try to be crazy and do crazy things to make people either afraid of me uh, or think I was 6'4", 245. There is to no extremes what I would go to to make sure that I created the perception that I needed for me to get the job done. He was one of the few players I ever coached that actually speeded up as he made his tackles. His deal was to get you in the radar screen and then he just accelerated right through and ran through you. He didn't tackle people in a beautiful way. It wasn't form tackling. It was a collision. The 1975 Grey Cup featured the Eskimos and the Montreal Alouettes. When Montreal's Don Sweet missed a last-minute field goal, Edmonton celebrated a one-point victory. It was the third year in a row we had gone to a Grey Cup and we had lost the first two. And, and I never doubted our, our ability to win or desire to win. What it did more than anything else was prove that you could do it. That 75 Grey Cup was probably the start of what the Eskimos started to become. Because that particular year, we had won uh, five or six games in the last two minutes. And all of a sudden, people started to fear what we as a team could do, and probably more importantly, what Wilkie and Bruce could do. In 1977, the Eskimos signed a coaching unknown, a 36-year-old with no professional experience, Hugh Campbell. When I was offered the job in Edmonton, I wasn't uh, confident that I was qualified to, to take the job. Matter of fact, I was quite young, and uh, so I, I had some doubts. I, I felt confident that I could do it if, if I could just get started, if people could believe in me. Despite his youth and lack of experience, Campbell quickly earned the respect of his players with his unique approach to the game. I knew that players were used to a long list of rules. Don't do this, don't do this, be on time for this. I only had one rule, it was don't do anything that in the head coach's opinion is detrimental to the team performance. That was my rule. The 1977 Edmonton Montreal Grey Cup became famous for the construction staples the Alouettes used for traction. On a frozen field in Olympic Stadium, Edmonton would never find their footing as they lost the game 41 to six. To me, that was the best thing that could have ever happened to the Edmonton Eskimos because as the, as the local media didn't believe us, they thought we were making excuses, that made us work that much harder in the off season that we wanted to go back to prove that we were a better team in that, that those staples did make a difference. It just became sort of a 
rallying point for us that regardless of what circumstances, what hand you were dealt, um, we would shut up and play football. We could not wait until the 1978 season to play Montreal. We didn't care where it was. We'd have played them in a parking lot. We played flag football, but we were not going to lose to the Montreal Alouettes again. The 1978 Grey Cup would give the Eskimos their chance for revenge. But this time, there would be a new quarterback in the green and gold, a U.S. college star who was ready for the NFL long before the NFL was ready for him. That discrimination and stereotype made me both sad and angry because, uh, you know, I felt like it just wasn't fair that I should get the same opportunity anybody else should. I should be judged on my abilities and not on my skin color or some stereotype. Hugh Campbell came down and made known his interest in me as a quarterback. It was an opportunity that I was being given that I didn't see happening in my own country. And I, I really weighed the pros and cons of going to Canada or staying in the United States. And I chose to go to Canada because they were giving me a realistic opportunity to play the game that I love. When Warren Moon got here, he was absolutely everything I thought he was. And everybody said, boy, you really taught him. I said, yeah, what did I teach him? How to run real fast? or to throw the ball 80 yards. I always thought it was a break for me that I was getting to play half the game. Everybody else said, well, that was really a break for him because he got to play right away. Well, he was good enough to play right away. Edmonton's triumph in the 1978 Grey Cup marked the beginning of the greatest dynasty in CFL history. Back-to-back -back victories over the Alouettes, followed by a decisive 48-10 win over the Hamilton Tiger Cats, made the Eskimos seem practically unbeatable. But in the 81 final against Ottawa, Rough Riders quarterback J.C. Watts took charge. As Warren Moon and the Eskimos struggled, it looked like Edmonton's championship reign was about to end. We were down 20 to 1 at halftime and we're not getting anything going and Warren is the starter and Wilkie comes in uh, late in the second quarter and puts on a show, puts on a show. You know, I played a disastrous first half. You know, Wilkie came in and kind of got us settled down right before the half. And in the second half, we were able to make some plays offensively. Our defense stepped up and really got us the football, shut them down. I think we had total focus that at some point we were going to find a way to win this football game. With an amazing 26-23 victory, the Eskimo streak continued. Following the retirement of Tom Wilkinson, Warren Moon took over. In the 1982 Grey Cup against Toronto, he connected with his favorite target, receiver Brian Kelly, to bring a fifth consecutive championship to Hugh Campbell's Eskimos. We ended up winning five Grey Cups in a row. And so I got five rings out of the six years that I was there. It was a great run, probably one of the greatest runs you'll ever see in sports. Again, I don't think you'll ever see a team win five straight championships in any sport, but we had a great, great run. In 1983, the Edmonton Eskimos found the perfect replacement for Warren Moon, a quarterback who played like a linebacker, Louisiana Tech grad Matt Dunnigan. Matt Dunnigan was the first quarterback after Warren Moon, which is not a, a, you wouldn't think that would be a good time, but Matt was one of those feisty, smart, uh, competitive quarterbacks, and he was cocky enough to replace Warren Moon and uh, skilled enough. I didn't know who Warren Moon was. Um, I didn't know who anybody was. I didn't know where Edmonton, Alberta was. Uh, I came up just with the attitude that I was going to learn about the CFL, put my best foot forward, which I was taught to do, and give it my best shot and see what happened. While Dunnigan replaced Moon, the Eskimos were about to discover a player like none other, a kick return specialist who brought the fans to their feet, Henry Gizmo Williams. Well, when I first came up and I saw this big old wide field, like, I'm like, holy shazam. Like, I said to myself, thank God I didn't run track up here. <laughs> this field was huge. Gizmo kept the Eskimos the Eskimos. Uh, he, uh, he had the sizzle. They, they didn't have a lot of stakes some, through some of those years, but he just came in here and he just stole the hearts of the town from the oldest little old lady in town to the youngest kid. They just loved the guy and what he did. The Giz had two speeds. 
faster and faster. I mean, you could turn it on. One time we were in Edmonton and Giz took off and I'm like, I got the angle on this puppy. He's about 30 yards away from me, still upfield, and I got the angle. I'm going to the sideline. By the time I got to the sideline, I turned, all I saw were cleats. He was gone. Although Edmonton is a long way from Tennessee, not even the chill of a Canadian winter could slow down the Giz. Mount 25 was the best I liked, because I loved that. I used to spray my jersey down with water when I get outside, because it turned the ice and slip and the guys couldn't grab me. <laughs> Dunnigan's hard charging style made injuries a constant threat. In 1986, the Eskimos got an insurance plan, Damon Allen. I remember sitting down with Damon and telling him, look, I said, this is, I, uh, I'm the starter, you know, you're trying to take my job. I understand that, it's good healthy competition, but don't lose sight of the fact that we're in this together. And so Damon and I are always able to have a great working relationship and support one another. In the 87 Grey Cup, Dunnigan went down to injury. Damon Allen responded with an MVP performance, and Gizmo Williams electrified the crowd with a 115-yard touchdown run and a 38-36 win over the Argos. When I won my first Grey Cup, it was almost like me being in a plane crash or something, and I lived through it. That's what it felt like to me, because I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to act. I didn't know should I drink. I didn't know should I run outside naked. I didn't know what the hell to do. but. It was something inside of me like, man, do you realize you just won the Grey Cup, the, the number one game in the CFL? In 1991, Ron Lancaster was named head coach of the Eskimos. Two years later, he had Edmonton in championship form. We felt the team, we had a chance. Now, there were some times during the year when it certainly didn't look like we were going to win. But late in the season, come the 1st of October, we got on a roll. I mean, we started winning. And when you start winning and you start gaining confidence, man, if things start to mushroom, and you know, you, you all of a sudden start to feel good about yourself. 1993 brought another Grey Cup to Edmonton, a 33-23 victory over Winnipeg. When that game ended, it was fun. Just kind of stand over here on the side with Hugh and just kind of watch what's going on because it, you know, you you know, it's done, man. It, it's accomplished. You have won the Grey Cup. But the best thing about that is, in, is to watch the players. Everybody was up on the stage, and I was standing about 30 yards away, just in the middle of the field, looking at the stage as they received the Grey Cup. And then I looked over beside me, and there was Ronnie Lancaster. And uh, the two of us were just watching everybody else uh, get the award, and it was just where we wanted to be at that moment. The names may change and the stars may come and go, but in Edmonton football, there is one constant. Rain or shine, the fans are there. I ran more touchdowns on that grass field because of the fans in Edmonton. I just always felt like when I lined up on that football field, I always had that extra, it was 13 guys on the football field. I had that one extra with the fans. The fans love the Eskimos because, I mean, listen, what is it now, 32 consecutive years they've made the playoffs. Uh, they've won all of those Great Cup championships. But they played very, very entertaining ball. And so the fans respond in a like way. They say, we're with you. We love you. <laughs>